Thank you, family. Thank you, thank you. Wow. Um, Pastor AJ is absolutely biased in that introduction and every because he loves and we love them. Um, yeah. Thank you for that first no for the sermon. We appreciate that a lot. <laughs> No, I love you um, so much. Family, I want to share a couple of pictures with you. The first one would be on the screen, and that would be your Korean family. We just, as Pastor AJ said, fifth year. So they're you, like mission, vision, value, they're you, except more Koreans. And the second picture is of our Young Adult Street Treat um, that we had just last month. <sighs> How these young adults love God, worship God, and love each other in an unusual way, it is extremely difficult to not to be super proud of them. Even if you try real, really hard, you're like, I am proud of them. I am proud of them. They're amazing. They're, what God is doing and who they are are simply amazing. And can I say, um, Grace Covenant Church Chantilly, that you are the mother church that gave birth to both of those congregations and gatherings. So I honor you. I thank you. You're amazing. These things would not have happened without your perseverance, your obedience, your love for the Lord, and your generosity. So honor you and thank you so much, family. Yeah. Do you join me in standing in the reading of the Word of God? We want to honor the Word of God in our posture in the best way we know how. We'll read from 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24 to 25, and I want to speak to you from the topic of holistic revival. Because when revival comes, yes, it starts here. But that's the beginning, and that's what I feel like the Spirit of God wants to speak, speak to you this afternoon or this morning. Verse 24 to 25, 2 Samuel chapter 12, 24 to 25. Then David comforted his wife, Sheba. He went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message to Nathan, by Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word, we fully recognize and humble ourselves before you and declare the truth that we cannot understand and our lives will not be transformed in a way that is actually meaningful and powerful without your work in this moment. We were saved by your grace and right now in this moment, we ask for the full access of your grace one more time. Not because of us, not because we're good, not because we deserve it, but because you are so good. You have never failed us. You never disappoint us. You, you always overwhelm us with your grace and your goodness and your love. And I expect nothing less as we open your word today, Lord. We thank you. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated in the presence of God. When the Holy Spirit moves in our lives, in our church, the Holy Spirit brings holistic revival to us. Yes, it starts to transform what happens here in a room like this or maybe at a conference or maybe at a Young Adults United retreat or whatever other moments that are special to you that's corporate. Absolutely, it starts there and there's repentance and there's much grace and there's some weeping there, absolutely, and rejoicing there, absolutely. But that's where the Holy Spirit starts. His goal, his desire, his plan for you and me is to start that revival there but lead to so many other places. There's a holistic revival that God always brings. And can I share with you, family, that I am dreaming for a revival that is holistic and maybe you want to join in that dream as well. Um, about five or maybe six years annually, me and my wife, we got to minister to a children's home down in Florida. In that home, when you visit, you are going to see two different types of groups of kids. The first group are what they call just local or domestic children, um, abused or neglected or in many ways that we can't share, just wrong in every way. So they said, well, can we take them in because the parents cannot take care of them. So they're there, and they're as young as two years old. Actually, there are some infants there as well, and they will just love on them till they turn 18. 
The other group of kids are what they call UAC children, unidentified alien children. These are children outside of United States coming to find better life for actually for most of them just for food and shelter and protection. We heard stories about four-year-olds and six-year-olds hanging on top of the roof of a train crossing the border. We heard stories about a four-year-old girl walking over a desert over a month with just water with, his, with her brother who was eight years old coming over to the United States. There are many other stories like that. And when, when they were pulled over, they said, okay, what do we do with these children? Because they're minors. We can't just send them back. We got to make sure they're taken care of, that they're loved, that they're covered by adults. And these group of people, their children, some they said, well, can we volunteer to care for them while you figure them out? So they send their children and these children, and most of them do not speak a word of English, and they're there, and you don't know how long they're going to be there. They could be sent back a week later or two years later. They might hopefully find a parent here, but we just don't know. We got to minister with them. We got to care for them. And we love that place. We're caring for the children. But the circumstances of ministry wasn't that great. We didn't even have a lunchroom, so we would eat in the van and no sound system or nothing as we tried to do ministry. So it was kind of rough, but we loved that ministry. And I think it was five or six years into the ministry, we built some trust, and they said, why don't you come over to our lodging place? So these UAC children invited us to their home. We, got, we, we, we did security clearance so, that, clearance so make sure that everything's fine, and we got to visit them. And when we walked in, wow, we were surprised because it was so very nice. I've never lived in a home like that, ever. They had a piano. They had the drum set, they had guitars, everything was freshly painted. How many of you live in that home right now, freshly painted? Some of you have not painted your house in the last 30 years. And you're trying to sell the house. Guess why it's not working? I don't know. Everything was amazing. They had the biggest flat screen TV that you can find. And this is back when it was a lot more expensive than now to get a flat screen TV and a PlayStation and a computer for themselves to just study. I was like... What is going on here? We don't have a lunchroom. What is going on here? And this, and we got, so we got to have lunch with one of the leaders, and we asked, like, what's going on? And how did you make this happen? How do you fund this? And they said, well, we had this vision to not only share the message of God, but help these children to feel the message of God in the best way we know how, because they're children. We want them to feel it in the way that they can hear. So we reached out to the local churches and said, hey, can you come and paint? Can you build something? Can you build beds for these kids so they have fresh beds and, and everything, sheets and everything? Could you donate? Do you have a piano that you don't use? Do you have a TV that you don't use? You're a big church. Do you have a drum set that you don't use? And the local churches gather around them and say, yes, we would love to show the love of God. It wasn't unlike Luke 15 because when the prodigal son left the home, it was the memory of the father's home, which was so great. He looked back and said, okay, I don't deserve it, but maybe I could go back because there's nowhere like it. Because their children, they couldn't really hear. And some of them didn't speak the language well enough to hear. So they said, we want them to feel it. As you hear that story, I know you feel it and I feel it. That, that holistic love that you hope they will experience is from God. And, but can I say, dare I say, flip the script and say that holistic love, God wants you to experience it as well. It is not only for them, it is for you as the children of God. That is the sonship and that is the daughtership. And, you know, last week I know we had the webs presenting and I love what they said. I think what they said was Mali Bongwe. If I pronounced that wrong, I am so sorry. But what they're saying is they're, they brought these women and they said, we don't just want you to be fed. They don't, we don't just want you to have roof over your head. We want to train you in parenting, in cooking, in, in, so that you could have jobs in different ways. I love that. There's a holistic gospel being preached but what if i submit to you as we study the scripture when revival of jesus christ comes that there's that holistic restoration or holistic revival that comes and that is god's plan if we choose to say yes to god in every way it is not it is not only sunday moments that become greater but it is your homes it's your workplaces it's your internal inner inner man being strengthened by the blood of jesus christ 
In order for us to expand on today's passage and that idea, I got to go back to the immediate context, which actually starts in chapter 11, verse 1. And I want to read for you. This is what 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 says. In the springtime, at the time when kings go off to war, I got to stop. That was the king's job. It was Monday and it was commute time. He was to go off to war, but it says, David sent Joab out to the king's men and the whole Israel army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba, but David remained in Jerusalem. And you're going to find that that is important because the Bible puts it there in a context, in a very specific and with, with, with very, very clear intention. And we'll see that being restored at the end of this story or this phrase of this story at the end of chapter 12 and verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed. So you notice that it's evening that he got up? So maybe a nap or maybe a really rough night, whatever that means for you. Ah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) Walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. Oh, and the Bible says the woman was very beautiful. Beautiful woman bathing, and you just got up from a really long nap. Recipe for disaster, isn't it? <laughs> so you know the story. He, he commits murder. He commits adultery. He commits so much sin. Some scholars will say David basically broke every commandment out of the Ten Commandments between chapter 11 and chapter 12. Here's the thing that is interesting about David's life. His life got really difficult in the beginning phases of his call, right? I mean, a madman Saul was chasing after him, and he had to pretend like he was a madman. And Ziglag, he, his, his wives and children were taken away, and even his men wanted to stone him and kill him. He was alone, and he was broken. His life sometimes doesn't seem to be going up and down. But here's an interesting thing about David's life. Even when the circumstances seem to be going descending, his walk before God, his throne room approach was always ascending for some reason. Yet this is the first time, chapter 11, in this context, that he's, his approach to the throne room seemed to be descending for the first time. And it's unfortunate. And that's where we find ourselves in, in this passage. In chapter 12, here's a turnaround or a blessing from God. Chapter 12, verse 1 says this. The Lord sent Nathan to David. So imagine, imagine if you sin or mess up or I sin and mess up. And you put your kids to bed and you're about to, I don't know, call it a night and you're kind of hanging around. And you hear a knock on the door. And you go like, who could be here at this hour? You walk down, open the door. Pastor Jim Critcher is standing. (laughs) I have a word for you, my daughter. God spoke to me last night about you. And he stares at you intently till you're embarrassed. But but here's the thing, here's the thing. One of the greatest, that's not going to happen, so don't worry. (laughs) But here's the thing that is one of the greatest blessings, and that is of hope for all of us. That through the pulpit or through the man of God or woman of God, as they preach, may you hear the word of God, especially when you and I mess up. How How many of you know that that is actually one of the greatest blessings as we walk with God? That we have a church family, that we are in a small group, that we know each other, we are being disciples, so that when we're off, someone can speak into our lives. That's a blessing. May you have that blessing. Because this is where revival starts to happen, family. Without that, there's no revival. That's where it happens. The word of God coming to you, coming alive, and transforming your life, and it's convicting, it's loving, and you're weeping, and you love God, and say, God, thank you for mercy and grace, because I need so much of it. And that's where it starts, and, that's, and David responds in verse 7 saying this. Now, verse 13 says this. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. And listen. Most of us, we look at this story and say, okay, David sinned. Pastor Jim, oh no, Pastor Nathan came and David repented and Nathan says, you're not going to die. Or, 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 you and I messed up, you came to church, you heard a message or you went to a conference or somewhere and you heard a message, you were convicted and you got right with God. And we think that's revival. It is, but it's not the whole revival. Because listen to me, this is where revival starts for David. This is not where it ends. 
I want to share with you and I want you and I to dream together and pray for three other revivals that comes once you and I start to get right with God. And the first one that I want to start share with you is this. There is a revival of workplace that comes. Remember the context of chapter uh, 11 verse 1 that king didn't, kings, when they go off to war, David didn't go. This is verse 29 at the end of chapter 12. So David mustered. He's proactive, he's leading, he's courageous, he's bold, he's conquering the entire army and went to Reba and attacked it and captured it. His workplace experienced revival. May you have that blessing, family. It it wasn't just that, oh, I repented before God and Psalm 51, God, I am repenting and come on, God, cleanse me. And that's all true. That's where we start. And when that happens, as you press into the Lord, you'll find that God restores your leadership. I got some leaders in this room. I can feel it by the Spirit of God. He's going to restore your leadership wound whenever you get right with God. When this revival, the water of revival start to fill this place, here's the thing that's going to happen. Every one of marketplace leaders in this room, you're going to find unusual wisdom in the next season that you have not had. It won't be about you getting more of the podcast or the books or other things. It will be a download from wisdom because what happened to Joseph? This is what happened to Joseph. He didn't only get to figure out what the dream meant, what the dream meant to Pharaoh. He said, this is what it looks like and you are going to have a great seven years and you're going to have the most horrible recession in the next seven years and this is what you will do. You will have that wisdom. And the city will be different because your marketplace, your workplace, our workplace experience revival. I pray for that. I pray for you for that. What if the gospel of Jesus Christ and the move of the spirit of God and the revival is starting here and that water, that precious revival water is flowing into your business, into your workplace. And you're like Daniel and Joseph at your workplace. They don't quite like you that much because you're a crazy Christian. But they're like, we cannot live without her. Gosh, she's so brilliant. I don't even know what to do. Because personally, I'm like, a little rubs me in a different way, kind of different. But they're so amazing. I believe that's revival. I believe God did that in David's life. Me and my wife and, hi, my wife. We um, did youth ministry about 10 years before we planted. Loved youth ministry. And when we were planting, um, we met this young man. He came to us when he was a seventh grader, a teenager. Um, When they turn into a teenager somehow, especially seventh grade, sixth grade, um, they are, um, how do I put this, different. (laughs) They came, but it was just not normal different, way different. Um, he, he moved to the States when he was, I think, five or six, and in his family, he didn't really have a great experience, so he felt rejected when he came. Some of it was, I'm sorry, um, discrimination. Some of it was his language, and he just felt rejected all over. And how many of you know that when we're wounded, if we don't get healed, it doesn't just stay there, but it festers and it becomes an addiction. So when it's wounded, he was wounded, so, and then it wasn't taken care of over a long period of time. So he was addicted to anything and everything that you and I can imagine or, or think about. He came to us. He needed Jesus. We went to a youth retreat, and youth respond quite well to a retreat. And thank you for supporting our youth ministry and sending them to the retreat. And they again came, I think he was a 10th t- grader, and, you know, in a youth ministry, you know, you do that thing where you dim the lights. You have a piano player playing in the background. So it's like romantic, but not with a girl, but with God, right? So you're like, and the pastor gets up and speaks sometimes softly. Jesus loves you so much. Sometimes passionately. And he's calling you out to the kingdom of God, right? Whatever it takes, right? We're not manipulating. We're just creating an environment, right? And we say, if you want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, come on up, come on up, come on. And these teenagers were coming up, and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. That kid, he stood up. He was walking down the aisle. I said, God, thank you, Jesus, because he needs Jesus. And I got more faith, and so I mustered my faith and said, okay, second calling. Thank you, thank you. Go back to your seats. Those of you who feel like you are vocationally called to ministry, missionary, full-time, and you want to give that part of your life to Jesus as a missionary or pastor, missionary or pastor, come on up. And then he stood back up, and he was walking down, and I was scratching my head going spiritually and going, God, that can't be right. <laughs> I don't think he is, I don't think, and I, was like, I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, qualified? I'm like, Yeah. 
So June, when I called you, whoa, okay, 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 stop, stop, stop. Don't finish that sentence, Holy Spirit. I heard you, and yes, I said, oh, thank you so much, Queen. God bless you. Let me anoint you. Thank you so much. After that, he loved church, and he showed up every day to church. Every day, even, if when we, even when we didn't have gatherings. He was there more than me as a pastor. He loved the church, and um, when he was, I think, 11th grade, he came to talk to me. He said, Pastor, I got to talk to you. And parents, you know what I'm talking about when they come to you and say, I got to talk to you. And you have this sense going in the back of your head going like, oh, this conversation's got to be bad. <laughs> So you prepare your heart. I prepare my heart. I'm sitting in front of my desk after, pray, after praying for quite some time. He walks, in, he walks in and he pulls out a crinkled piece of paper on my desk. And I said, huh, first of all, you should say hi. <laughs> Second of all, why are you giving me trash? <laughs> and he said, oh, open it up. So I open it up. I read it. It's his report card. And I go, it goes, D, D, D minus, F, F, something like that, F, D, more F than Ds. And I said, oh, this um, is a um, problem. And he said, exactly. Um, I'm a pastor. Go find a tutor, professional help. I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> and he said, I came for help. So I was like, I don't know. And then in that moment, the Holy Spirit reminded me to tell him my story. I said, what my story? And he said, biology. I said, Biology. Oh, because listen, folks, and this is what I told them. I didn't like biology when I was studying and when I was in high school, especially 10th grade and 11th grade. I didn't like studying, actually, but especially biology I didn't like. And what I loved doing is because I met the Lord, I would come home after school, after hours, and throw my book bag to the corner of my room, and I would sit in front of a piano and just worship God because I hated studying, but I loved worshiping Jesus. You see the disconnect, right? And I'm just like, but that's where most of us live, right? So I'm just playing the piano. And one day, a miracle happened. Miracle, y'all. Miracle happened where I was playing my piano, worshiping Jesus. So holy, worshiping Jesus. I'm not going to do my homework, but I'm holy, right? <laughs> a miracle happened where from the deep well inside of my soul, I wanted to study. Some of you are not receiving as a miracle. It's because you don't know me. I wanted to say, and I, especially biology. And I said, huh. And I studied till 3 a.m. that day. That never happened in my life. After that, the Holy Spirit helped me, but I, I had to put in my discipline and work on it with the Holy Spirit with spiritual disciplines and other self-disciplines. But, but God really built that in me, and now I love studying. So I told him this story, and I told him, because the Bible says, not by power, not by might, but by the Spirit of God. So, so I said, son, listen to me. Have you ever, ever relied on the Holy Spirit when it comes to your study? I know you pray for it, God help me. No, no, no. Rely, because you know that's different, right? Have you invited the power of the Holy Spirit to your study, to your workplace? And he said, huh, I never did. And his life started to change, and I would actually invite him on regular weekdays and say, okay, you sit down with me, and you will study, and I'll prepare a sermon. And his life started to change slowly but surely. There was a restoration of workplace. A man that I love is a man named Brother Lawrence. I love his book. And one of the things that he did was all his life, he wanted to be in the presence of God. He was injured, um, so he couldn't do other things. But he did two things for his whole life. One, fixing shoes. Second, taking care of the kitchen, whether it be frying an egg or, or wiping the floors. But one spiritual discipline that he leaned on all his life, come on, some of you know this, was acknowledging and inviting and honoring the presence of God. Everything, everything that he did and everywhere he went. And once there's a story about his, he was on the kitchen floor mopping the floor and he's in worship in the presence of God. He's not saying anything. He's not saying anything. And then a man walks in, might be his brother. He falls down at the power and the glory of God because he's struck by the power of God in the kitchen, not in the sanctuary, in the kitchen. Not because the man has said anything, but he practiced being in the presence of God so much. Wherever he went, the climate started to shift, and the presence of God and the cloud of God came, just like the Israelites in the Old Testament. What if that is our call and vision and dream from God wherever you and I go, wherever your workplace is? Whether it be kitchen, the back room, or as a CEO or leader. What if the cloud of the presence of God wants to go with you and transform and bring revival to the city 
and to your coworkers and to your employer and to employees. That is the revival of workplace that we're talking about, family. Revival starts here. Yes, it starts here. Oh, but it flows out to everywhere. And we, that's what we see in the river of life in the book of Ezekiel. Now, let me pause before I move on to the second point. If you're a parent or a leader, please listen to me. Because you might be listening to my story and going like, Pastor, can you meet with my eighth grader? Because uh, he does not like studying. Biology too, just like you. Can you pray for him? It's like, not really, but this is what I want to say. Because, listen, the reason why I say not really is not, because he, really, he didn't really have a parent figure to disciple him. But here's this, this is one thing that I want to say. Maybe it's not about him or her. Maybe it's about us. Have you thought about how long it took David to restore his workplace to restore? How long it took David? Most theologians think it's at least two years. Why? Because verse 15 and verse 24, we find that between him and Bathsheba, they had two babies. I wasn't great at biology, y'all, but I know it takes some time to have babies. And, and because of the mourning period and that's a tradition that they had, as most scholars will say, at least two years. Listen, if David, the man of God, the man after God's own heart, where Jesus would say, well, I'm in the lineage of David. If that man in his restoration workplace took two years plus, maybe your kid isn't that messed up. Maybe it is our patience that needs to grow. Because here's the saying that I actually made. I'm like, I made, which is like, why am I quoting myself? That is weird. But here's the thing that I think God gave me is, is even if what you're praying for or asking for is right and it is the will of God, demanding your timing is called pride. So whatever you're praying for, that person or that child or your spouse even, it is accurate. You heard right from the Holy Spirit. Yes, it is the will of God. It is true. That needs to happen. That is wrong. However, demanding your timing is called pride because 1 Peter 5, 6 says this. Humble yourselves, right? So it's about humility, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up in what? You know this, in due time. So timing and humility always goes together. So demanding our timing is our pride. So maybe when we're prideful, we're forcing things, we're coercing things, and the fruit of the Holy Spirit is not flowing through us. Maybe that is the bigger issue than how quickly they're getting into AP classes. Or the kind of college that they'll get into. Or the kind of job that they'll have. Or the kind of spouse that you will have. Maybe, maybe, maybe the patience, the work of the Spirit of God in us is what matters the most. Because it is. And that is the revival of workplace family. And that's what it takes. That patience, that, that God pressing us into being more patient, that is, listen to me, the revival of workplace and also the second point, revival of the spirit of family. Not just family, but the spirit of family. Verse 24 says this, then David comforted his wife. Somebody say comforted. His wife, Bathsheba. And here's an interesting thing. If you actually read through the whole chapter, this is the first time, actually, the entire Bible, the first time ever in the Bible that calls Bathsheba David's wife. So if you go back to verse 15, this is what's happening. They're legally married. Bathsheba's ex-husband has passed away. Or David killed him. Murdered him. Legally married. But in verse 15, you know what the Bible says? They're legally married. Ex-husband had passed away. Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. This is the first time ever that the Bible is saying, oh, it is now David's wife. How many of you know that God is really not impressed with your legal paperwork when it comes to your marriage? Whether you have the spirit of the family in you or not does not depend on what the court said, really. God is really not impressed with that. I mean, he wants you to follow the legal laws and regulations, no doubt about it, but... That's not the stamp that sets you right with God. Now, here's the thing that we find, because you find that even when David started, it was about the heart, remember? The, 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 you know, the, son, the, the brothers, and at the end, David's heart was what Samuel had to see, which he missed, right? And the Bible says he had the heart after God. And listen to me, then what is the heart that made the spirit of family, that transition that God says, oh, now I see it. Yes, she is now your wife. 
I don't care what you try to do and what you try to cover up in the past that didn't work in front of me. You cannot lie to me. But now I can see it. What was it? Let's go back to the, to the passage. Then David, what? Comfort his wife. Do you know what the core of spirit of family is? It's comforting each other. You had a long day at work. Your boss was mean. Your customer was mean. You had a long day at work. Or actually, at home. Your children was a mess. But you still come together and say, hey, how can I comfort you? Listen, listen. The context, chapter 11. What was the first, what was the first reproach that David had towards Bathsheba? It was all about his needs. Oh, she looks so attractive. Oh, I want her. It was about his needs, his needs, his needs. And after that, he was trying to make sure that she stays quiet, we believe. She was trying to fix her. This was the first time ever she's looking at his, he's looking at his wife and saying, you lost a baby. As a mother and a woman, that's tough. Actually, I caused it, didn't I? How can I comfort you? Wouldn't you want to live in that home, not a house, but a home where you walk in and everyone in that place is trying to comfort each other? Isn't that our dream? What if revival of God that is coming in this season ushers that into your home? I want that for my home. I want that to flow through me to my wife. And God wants to give you that blessing as we contend and press in. It starts here, but it flows into your workplace and then into your family. Last and I'll close on time. Third one is the revival of sonship or daughtership. Revival of sonship or daughtership. Remember, David and Bathsheba, they lost a child. If there's anyone in this room who lost a child in any way, us as pastors of this house, we are so sorry. We would love to pray for you. We would love to love on you and support you in any way we can. The very first, um, well, not, I don't want to talk, not, not the first one, actually. There are many funerals that I got to be part of uh, as a privilege, as a pastor, especially in the um, first seven years of my ministry. And it was tough seeing people weep over losing dear parents. Brothers and sisters, so tough. But I kind of always had something to say or prayer to give. But there was a funeral, actually there were a couple of them, that I had nothing to say, nothing to give. It was a funeral of a, of a mom who lost a 12-year-old son. And I'm there because I'm the youth pastor. What, what do you say? What, what scripture do I pull out? That's not salt to the wounds. What, what do I do? I remember sitting there basically at least all half day or all day, sitting next to the family and just weeping with them because it broke my heart as well because I loved that guy as well. I loved that guy as well. I couldn't understand the wisdom of God. I didn't know what to say. I didn't have clever cliches to share, nothing to share. I couldn't even pray for them. I just wept with them, and I left the house. God wants to comfort you all, but in that, listen to me. There's a restoration that God does in moments like that. It is not only a rest. When God gave that son to David Solomon, listen, family, it wasn't just like, oh, you lost a son, let me give you a son. It wasn't like that because that's not the character of God. But he restores a sonship. Ladies, when I say sonship, I'm including you because I want to include the inheritance that came with the biblical idea of sonship. What happened? In verse 24, it says this. The scripture says this. Then David comforted his wife, Bathsheba. He went to her and made love to her. She gave birth to a son. And they named him Solomon. And this is what God does. Thus far, this is what David and Bathsheba has done. And this is what God does. This is what God does. The Lord loved him. And this is the gospel. Because what did Solomon do? Nothing. He was just birth. And God says, I love you. And furthermore, next verse, 25. And because the Lord loved him, it wasn't enough that God said it once. He's going to say it twice in this short verse. He sent a word through Nathan, the prophet, to name him Jedediah. You know what, the, what that name means, Jedediah? The one that the Lord loves. So in this short passage, there's three times that the Lord says, I love him, I love him, I love him. 
And I think there's an internal dialogue between David and God. And I don't think I'm wrong because that's all of us and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's looking at Solomon saying, I love him more than anything in the world. I could die for this, this son. You are so proud. I am so parents. You look at your sons and daughters and says, I couldn't love anyone anymore. And God is looking at David and saying, son, I love you like that just a lot more. May you hear that because, listen, maybe some of you just like me, you made a big mistake in the past. You really messed up. Everyone knew that you messed up, and I, I knew that I messed up. And I didn't know how to bring it to God. And maybe you're just like me in that I know the gospel in my head, but because of that big mess of, I always kind of go to God and say, God, I know you love me and I feel it, but are we actually really okay? Are we, are we okay? I keep asking, are we okay? Are we okay? And I don't think David was free from that. And I hear God saying to David and maybe you in this room, when I chose you in the beginning, it wasn't because you did something right. When you were just a mere shepherd, when no one cared for you and no one looked at you, I chose you because I loved you just like your son because he was just birthed and I love him. He didn't do anything wrong or right. He was just birthed, mostly wrong. I love him. I love him. I love him. And I know you feel my heart towards your son. Guess what? That is the kind of love that I have for you and that is unconditional and that is not changing. Maybe some of you need to hear that in this room. Actually, I know by the Spirit of God that you need to hear that in this room. Because I was talking to Pastor AJ, and he senses that that is the message in this season. And as I hear Pastor Corey even through that offering message, that's exactly what he was sharing. We didn't put this together. It was the Spirit of God putting it together for you. There's a restoration of sonship that is coming in this house. In this house. Galatians 3.26 says this. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Let me do that again. So in Christ Jesus, you, we are all children of God. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. I don't know what you did, and you don't know what I did, and we don't need to know. But this is what I know with such certainty that God wants you to hear. He still loves you. He still has a plan for you. He still has a desire, and he still has a wonderful plan for you. He still delights in you. David messed up. None of us probably messed up as much as David did. You didn't break every commandment. But even if you did, here's God restoring your sonship, your daughtership, saying, I still love you. It was never about you. It was about despite you that I loved you. And is that what the gospel is? That Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. That is revival. That gospel coming into our inner being more than ever and strengthening more than ever. Say, God, other things might go awry, but you and I are good, and I feel this stronger than ever, and I'm good. I need this message so often. I love preaching this message because it ministers to me. Because that's what matters to me the most, and I think you're in this room. I think you're tuning in online because it matters to you. But what if it matters to God the most? I'll say that again. What if it matters to your father the most that he can't wait to restore that on you? He can't wait to bring that revival on you. He can't wait to say, oh, I know you've been hanging your head really low. I want you to lift your head because I died for you. Because I'm calling you my son all over because I love you. I'll finish with this one story. I didn't have a... I, I'm not going to say whose fault it is because it doesn't matter. I didn't have really a sonship kind of intimate relationship or relational way with my parents growing up. My wife did. So when I married my wife, I really got did a lot of different healing. And he, he didn't want to meet me before I got married. It was bad. Gospel of Jesus Christ and my wife. <laughs> That's my testimony. 
And um, once, once we had her parents over and, um, you know, he was using the study as a bedroom and a study room as well, her dad, and, and he's a great pastor. And I, one of the men that I respect the most in my life, not because of what he, great ministry that he has done, though he has done great ministry, but because of the dad and the man of God that he is, the character and the love and the gentleness and the patience that, and the wisdom that woods out of him, just woozes out of him regularly. And that's where, that's where, you know, my wife is, that's why my, wonderful, my wife is so wonderful, being loved in that way. And, you know, he was once, he, he had the room of the, the, the door of the uh, study kind of cracked open, and I could see that he was reading his Bible. And I'm going like, oh, man of God that I respect. I don't even want to make a squeak. So I'm kind of passing. It's my house, but I'm kind of squeaking, passing, making sure that I'm not disturbing him, right? And then as I'm passing by, I'm doing this. My wife from the across the room, he goes. And she flings herself to the next, next to him to the bed and she rolls around and says, Daddy, what are you doing? Dad, what you doing? What you up to? And I'm going, no, he's the man of God studying the scripture, the word of God. You can't do this and fling yourself next to him. Oh, and I saw the most delightful and a warm and loving smile come on his face. And just he stared and loved on her. He just didn't even say anything. And I said, I don't think I ever experienced that. Not that God wasn't giving that to me. And through that story, God has been speaking to me over and over. Son, you have that access to me. And that's what sonship feels like. You fear me, yes. But more than that, you're intimate. I'm intimate with you. What if the revival that we're praying for brings that to our hearts? I want that for you. I want that for grace. Let's pray that together. Let's ask, let's beseech heaven and say, God, we're not going to be satisfied with great worship moments. But we will not stop till you bring revival to every facet, every place of our lives, including the workplace, including our family life, and even in my soul. Strengthening of the inner man, Ephesians 3.16. God, may you have your way, your will be done in us, God. Let's pray that family. Let's dream that and see the city being one as we find the power of God, Christ in us. Let's pray. God, I'm praying that you'll come and even right now restore some sonships that's been lost. Family, if you, anyone in this room who don't really feel like, I, I don't think I'm a son or a daughter of God in any way, if that's you, God is inviting you and calling you and made this moment just for you. If that's you and you said, I want to get right with God right now. I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And through faith, I want to enter into the heritage. If that's you, shoot up your hand high right now. Come on. No, I see those hands at the back. I see those hands. Anyone else? Anyone else? Keep those. Yes, I see that. See that. See that. Thank you. Yes, anyone else in this side? Yes. Great. Great. Come on, let's pray that. If you raised your hand, pray this prayer after me. If you want to pray alongside with them, family, please do so as well. Come on, pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for your resurrection. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Abba Father. Abba Father. Abba Father. Thank you for making me your child. It's in your name we pray. Amen.